Well, thank you. Hello, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give a keynote, two keynotes, I guess, simultaneously at OSDI and ATC. I feel very honored. Um, these are also two conferences that I love. I feel very home at home here. These are my kinds of conferences. Um, and so um, I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, when I was asked to give a keynote, um, I tried to think about how to give a good keynote, what kinds of keynote would be appropriate for a pair of Usenix conferences like this. And I typed uh, Usenix keynote into internet search engines, and the top five hits uh, were all basically James Mickens, uh, which was a bit discouraging for me because I cannot possibly match James's uh, wit, erudition, and insight uh, in his keynotes. So um, I will do the best I can. Uh, so uh, having been failed by the internet, I uh, tried to remember the kind of keynotes I'd seen in the past and to sort of look at what sort of things uh, might make sense, what sort of models there were for how to give a good keynote. And there seemed to be a number uh, that I remember, one of which is um, I could sort of spend 45 minutes being smug about my past research and telling you about it. Uh, I don't really feel terribly smug about my research for reasons that will probably become clear uh, in the course of this talk. Uh, so that didn't seem to be terribly appropriate. Um, another one, other option is that I could sell you my latest and greatest startup. Uh, I don't have a startup, unfortunately, uh, and I'm unlikely to have one. So that didn't really work. Um, so I can't really do that. A third model appears to be that of kind of um, conference keynote as catharsis or conference keynote as therapy, where the speaker sort of basically unloads their years of pent-up frustration about how certain things in the, uh, the research community work or certain ideas uh, are propagated or things like that, um, and basically dumps that on the audience. Um, so I chose option three. Uh, sorry, but that's the way it is. I get to choose. And uh, that's what this talk will, to some extent, be about. So apologies for that. Also apologies for the fact that the topic of this talk is going to be pretty niche. I'm going to talk about operating systems, operating systems, et cetera, a pretty niche topic for operating systems design and implementation, uh, and indeed for uh, Usenix's annual technical conference these days. I'm going to focus on, OS on uh, OSDI in, um, with this data. Uh, in this conference, there are 31 papers. 6%, roughly, are about the design and implementation of operating systems. Okay, For comparison, fully a quarter of this conference uh, is devoted to machine learning. All right. If we look back a year, right, uh, OSDI 2020 was twice as big. There were 70 papers accepted in uh, 2020, but actually roughly the same proportion of them were actually about the design and implementation of operating systems. Uh, machine learning was a little bit smaller as a percentage there, or plenty of other good topics there. Um, Machine learning had two full, full sessions devoted to itself in 2020. Uh, this year, operating systems design and implementation doesn't even merit its own section. Right? It has to share that with hardware, which is ironic, given what I'm about to talk about. So we can speculate as to why this is happening. right? And, and one popular sort of um, folklore, if you like, for why there just isn't that much interest in operating systems these days is that basically Linux works. Yeah. Linux sort of got it right. Um, it works well enough. You know, what point is there in exploring radical alternatives to Linux when Linux just works? Almost any device you can buy quite happily runs Linux. So what's the problem there? Okay, uh, and there's some evidence for this. If we actually look at the few papers on operating systems design and implementation that were actually published at OSDI in the last couple of years, um, basically um, two of them last year and one of them this year are not basically written inside Linux. Now, this is a conference on operating system design and implementation, and almost all of the operating systems papers, the few operating systems papers that are accepted, take for granted the design of, of Linux and then tweak it in various ways in order to produce various improvements in terms of, for instance, uh, performance, latency, throughput, whatever you have. Okay. So what does this mean for the field of actual operating system design? Right? Does anyone 
in the audience here knows who's actually built and designed an operating system, whether it's a plausible research system or a production system, there's a hugely rich design space here, right? This is a, <laughs> a, a fascinating topic. I love this topic. Um, why is there absolutely no interest? Well, not no interest, but relatively little interest in this community in getting it published, right? Why are there very, very little published work on the design and implementation of operating systems, okay? It's clear that we are not necessarily valuing this work over other work in systems, okay? It's clear we're sort of deprioritizing it and we're not working on it or we're not submitting or we're not accepting it or whatever. There's a whole, probably a whole variety of reasons for that, right? And they're all sort of interlocking. Some of them are cultural, some of them are technical, some of them are financial. I don't want to go there, right? I'm not going to talk about that here. Instead, what I want to talk about in this keynote is that I want to argue that this is a bad situation. It's a bad situation because right now, this is the time when we really, really need good work in the design and implementation of operating systems. And we need it now because hardware is really changing in a way that really perturbs how we should think about operating systems. And we need a response from people who really understand the design and implementation of operating systems. And so it is bad that we devalue that work in this community. Now, I don't mean at all to criticize the conference, right? You know, look at other conferences as well. Uh, I love this conference. I think there's some great papers in this program, right? There's a lot of really, really good work going on. So this is not a criticism of OSDI or about the researchers who are published in OSDI this year. Uh, or about all this other work, including the machine learning work, right? You know, fine, it's great. I want to make an argument for why we need to really, really care about this relatively small topic of the design and implementation of operating systems, okay? And to do that, we need to really look very carefully at the hardware that we're now running these operating systems on. And before I do that, though, I need to explain exactly what I mean when I talk about operating systems. Yeah, so what do I really mean when I talk about an operating system? Okay. I want to be very clear about what I mean by an operating system. So you can define an operating system in a number of different ways, some good, some bad. I'm going to give you two examples here, one bad <laughs> and one good, which is the one I'm going to use in the rest of this talk. Okay. So the first one here is essentially ontological, and I don't find it terribly useful. right? That operating system is the kernel plus the daemons plus the system runtime libraries. Okay, um, I think this is a bad definition because it's pretty vague for one thing. Okay, right? What is a runtime library? Is libm.so a runtime library, for instance? It's that part of the operating system, part of the application. Worse, it actually doesn't say anything at all about what the operating system actually does. In fact, it strongly discourages critical thinking about what the operating system does. Okay, it's about what the operating system is, not what it does. And I'm much more interested in what it does because I'm worried about terminology that reduces that kind of tendency to think critically about things. This is not a definition here for operating system designers or implementers. It's not even terribly good as a definition for users. They don't really want to know about the kernel and the demons and everything else. They want to know what the operating system is doing for them, or in some cases, what it is failing to do for them. Okay, All right? The second definition is a functional definition, right? And this is what, the reason I like it. It says what the operating system actually does, right? The operating system is that part of the software running on a machine that is about securely multiplexing the machine's hardware resources, abstracting them in useful ways for the application, protecting applications from each other, protecting the operating system from applications, protecting data from unauthorized access, all that kind of stuff, using the hardware facilities available in order to do this, okay? This, I like. This is the definition that I want to use in this talk, right? And there's nothing terribly controversial about this. If this is actually some form of this kind of, of definition here is actually used in most operating systems textbooks that are used, used today, right? This shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that this is a reasonable definition of it. Um, but the funny thing about this definition is if you take this and you retrospectively apply this to reality, okay, so you take this definition and you say, okay, if that's what the operating system is, 
let's look at a modern system and let's see what the operating system is based on this definition. Something really rather unexpected happens. Okay? And that's sort of a fairly key theme of this talk. Okay? So let's actually look at what modern hardware really looks like. So here is your basic diagram of a computer system that we teach our students. Many of us think about this, this mental model of what's happening inside a computer. This is from a pretty good textbook on computer systems. We use this for teaching at ETH. It's, it's, it's great. I like it. Uh, it's Maybe it's a slightly outdated diagram, but what's interesting about this diagram here um, is that this is essentially a diagram of the machine that was used, slightly updated, to write Unix back in the day, 51, 52 years ago. Okay. All right, so we've got a processor, we've got some uh, devices down here, sit on the bus, we've got some memory. Fine, everything, everything's fine and dandy. And something like Unix works really, really well on a machine like this, right? Linux works really, really well on a machine like this. It's actually very simple. Now, of course, in practice, modern computers don't quite look like this, okay? So probably a more up-to-date way of viewing Modern computer hardware is something like this. This is a CC NUMA machine. Okay, it's multi-core, right? We've got a bunch of cores. They've got different nodes. They've got a cache. Got some memory down here. They've got a bunch of devices. They tend to sit on PCI Express or some other sort of useful peripheral bus with also nice fancy features, DMA, the works, and everything else like that. Okay. But again, this machine, this this model here is nice and appealing and simple. It's cache coherent, right? It's uniform. All these cores are basically they're all the same cores. They're non-uniform memory access that affects performance. But Linux, Unix models in general, you can use Linux as the main example of that, works just great for a machine like this. Okay. Now you can tweak this in various ways, right? You try and improve performance by looking at locking in the kernel or looking at better cache locality, replicating some data structures perhaps across different NUMA nodes, proper memory allocation. You know, you can tweak this in various different ways. You can also tweak the device drivers. Okay, you can fiddle around how to get better performance from your device drivers talking to the rest of the system. But basically, Linux works fine on this. Now, there's actually a lot of different ways you could write an operating system for a machine like this, but most operating systems that we actually use today look like the, the basic Unix model. We have a kernel. The kernel is a shared memory, multi-threaded program that runs in a single physical address space, allocates virtual memory, uses virtual memory, allocates virtual memory to a bunch of, sort of processes up here, some of these system demons. Um, inside the kernel, obviously, we use the cores, but we also have device drivers. Those device drivers might be moved up into user space in a sort of microkernel or something. You can move this boundary here up and down. But this is basically the model of an operating system at a high level. It's kind of boring. We all know about it. There's a lot of room for playing around in here. Um, but that's basically what we think of as a computer, OK? That's fine. Um, the trouble is that um, when we actually look at what real hardware is, this model of an operating system, which is basically derived from this model of a CC NUMA machine, OK, runs into problems. And the problems are that this model of a CC NUMA machine is a fantasy. This is not what a computer looks like. Right? This is what Linux wants a computer to look like. This is what Linux pretends a computer looks like. And Linux gets away with pretending that the computer looks like this because Linux isn't actually doing everything that you would expect an operating system to do. Right? Let me say this again. This model, this diagram of a computer, is a total fantasy. Right? It is a lie. In some ways, it, it is a dangerous lie. And I'll show you why it's dangerous later on in the talk. There are, there are danger in here. Okay, It's a fantasy. It doesn't exist. It's a fairy tale. Computers do not look like this. And if computers do not look like this, it's very possible that this is not what an operating system looks like. And I'm going to argue in some ways, actually, a slightly radical statement, this is not what an operating system looks like. Okay. It is what Linux looks like. Okay. So what's the reality? Well, here is fairly modern processor, system on a chip. This is a computer. This is what a modern computer looks like. Um, you can probably read the small print. This is actually an NVIDIA Parker here. Um, so what's going on here? Well, every one of these circles 
is a different set of processes. These processes see a different view of physical address space. They have different addressing properties. They are different architectures. They may or may not be cache coherent with each other and cache coherent with other sort of clusters all the way around in the system, okay? This is an enormously complicated beast. It doesn't look a bit like the nice model that I showed you that is the assumption, okay, in Linux, okay? And of course, a different SOC today, right? This is a modern SOC, this, this is product, it's highly successful. A different one is actually going to look different. It's going to have a different set of heterogeneous processes with a different set of address decoding rules that apply differently to different clusters in, in the same processor, and it's going to be programmed in a very different way, okay? Some of these are more colorful than others, okay? Some of them are arranged in different kind of ways. Um, Risk v was supposed to clear up this whole mess, right? You can imagine that programming this is a, is a messy business. Okay, Risk v was supposed to introduce a lot of cleanliness. I love Risk v. I think it's fantastic. I really, really hope it succeeds. I'm looking forward to it succeeding. But uh, in terms of making SOCs nice and clean, um, doesn't seem to be working great so far. Okay, even Xilinx, right, where you've got a lot of reconfigurable logic that should allow you to make things, you know, highly reconfigurable and, and clean, are also in on the game, right? You know, here is a zinc. It's got all kinds of different processes all over the place. This is the reality. This is what computers actually look like, okay, today. This is what they look like. Here's the last one. This is an NXP uh, formerly Freescale processor. Uh, this is actually from a board that we use for teaching at ETH, uh, teach operating systems using this kind of board here. Um, and so, you know, you can look at this and say, what's actually managing the hardware here? Okay. What is doing what our definition of an operating system said an operating system should do? Okay. What exactly is managing the hardware, securely multiplexing it, abstracting it, allocating resources, doing protection, and whatever. Okay. So what? what Linux is actually operating here as an operating system is this small cluster of cores here. That's it. Linux runs on that. What runs on all the rest of this stuff is a sort of random bric-a-brac of runtime executives, real-time kernels, microkernels, other kinds of stuff that runs on all the other processes in the system, okay? What that does collectively is the functions of the operating system. This is what the operating system is actually doing, okay? So we go back and we retrospectively reply, apply the definition. We say, okay, what is the operating system for this? And, and you realize that the operating system for this machine is not Linux. The operating system for this machine includes Linux as a component, but it also has to include all the rest of this stuff. So what is the design of this operating system? There isn't one. This is not an operating system that has been designed. This is an operating system that is congealed. Right? This is not going to end well. This does not look like a regular CC NUMA machine, right? I can say, yes, this machine runs Linux, sure. I can just say, well, I can say, my Android phone runs SpongeBob Krusty Cookoff, but that doesn't mean that SpongeBob Krusty Cookoff is the operating system, just because it happens to run on a small part of the hardware, okay? The thing that is performing the functions of the operating system is something else, okay? Linux might form a part of it, but it is a relatively small part of it, as we shall see. Okay, so if you're interested in what the issues are with operating system design and implementation, one thing is very clear, which is Linux is obviously not solving these problems, right? What is Linux? What Linux is doing here is allowing you to run existing applications on this thing somehow, right? And it's providing maybe some, um, you know, useful device drivers for some devices. It sure as hell isn't doing bootloading. That's all handled on a bunch of other processes down here. Okay, it's not doing power management. It's not doing a variety of other things. It's not doing security in some cases. Okay. So this is an interesting situation, right? Is this really a problem in practice? After all, you know, we've all got, you know, mobile phones and everything. Well, I would say that it is. So this is a problem for a number of reasons. I'm going to give you two examples of this, okay, but there are more, all right? Um, here's the first one. This is a security catastrophe, okay? So, um, Linux assumes that it's the only thing running on the machine. Of course, that's not true. 
And so bad things can happen. Here is the uh, Qualcomm, Qualcomm Qualpone exploit uh, from a year or so back. So what's happening here is that there's a Qualcomm uh, wireless modem. Linux views this as a dumb device that can do DMA, um, requests message buffers and things like that, puts messages in and everything. Uh, it's protected by the system MMU in the system so that it doesn't actually DMA accidentally into wrong places or that you know things are protected in that kind of way. What happens is actually this uh, this Qualcomm product is has its own processor, has its own DSP. That DSP is running a complete operating system. That operating system has vulnerabilities. In particular, it has a vulnerability over the wire. So bad packet comes in, takes over that operating system, completely compromises it. That operating system can then violate most of the assumptions that Linux makes about what this device can be expected to do. The device can fool Linux into programming the system MMU in a way that looks legitimate, but in practice grants the Qualcomm modem, which is now compromised, full access to the system. Okay, so bad stuff happen over the wire, better than root escalation attack. Now, um, you can patch this, but the solution to this that's given at the time is you patch the device driver for the Qualcomm modem. That's okay, but that's not fixing the basic problem, which is that there's a, a fundamental assumption inside Linux that it's the only operating system on the machine. There's nothing else there that's being reasonably intelligent. And it turns out there is an assumption that there's a single physical address space and that pointers don't need to be swizzled. And part of the confusion that's going on here is the need to do a whole load of intelligent pointer swizzling between different physical address spaces on the DSP and in the Linux sort of so-called host system. And that pointer swizzling is naturally delegated to the device driver because Linux has no concept of how to do this kind of thing because it doesn't fit in with the basic assumptions that Linux has, that it's a nice symmetric CC NUMA machine uh, running a single operating system with homogeneous cores and a shared physical address space. Okay, not good. We're gonna see more of these things coming up. The phrase here is cross SOC attack. And it's a very great interest to people. You know, you'll see people uh, attending DARPA workshops on this kind of thing. People are really worried about this kind of stuff. Here's a very different kind of problem, which is how you do power management. Okay, if you try to do fancy stuff in Linux with power management, perhaps making use of application knowledge, for instance, to do more intelligent use of, of sort of energy, you've got a problem, which is almost all the power management on, say, for example, this NXP chip um, is actually running on a different set of cores. It's running on this set of cores down here. Okay. Now, um, why is it doing that? Well, it's doing that because those are the set of cores that are responsible for bringing up the system and controlling power to everything else on the chip, and indeed, in many cases, the rest of the board. Okay, So or anything you might do inside Linux is trying to second guess a whole load of complicated policy that's already running on another computer inside the system, or the processor inside the system, with its own set of policies and its own set of ideas as to what it needs to do in order to be able to. Uh, manage power. Now, this is, from a systems perspective, is clearly broken, right? But it's not going to change because Linux doesn't have a good way of negotiating with this kind of thing, because Linux assumes that, no, it is the early operating system. And Linux can't absorb that operating system because it's running on a different processor with a different architecture in a different physical address space. Okay. So, um, other fields are clearly caring about this, right? So you're seeing a lot of attention paid to these kinds of attacks in the security community. A lot of people in the architecture community are thinking about how you might want to better construct these complex, asymmetric, heterogeneous, non-uniform multiprocessors that are modern computers. This is what's in every mobile phone or anything else like that. So they don't see Linux solving these problems. Right? So what do they do? They work around them by building hardware, because building hardware is what architecture people do. Okay, So they work around it. So we're seeing lots of weird hardware features, right? for example, that, that, that hive off security, right? secret processes, okay? hidden features in there that manage power transparently to Linux, because Linux doesn't actually deal with it, or any other operating system deal with it. And those operating systems don't deal with it because they can't, because their structure makes it very difficult to do that. Okay, so we're seeing increasingly large proportions of a computer being moved out of the realm of Linux, right? Linux no longer manages most of the computer, no longer does what an operating system is expected to do. Map functionality has been moved elsewhere by, as a result of the hardware design, okay? Alternative way of viewing this is that Linux has retreated, or your operating systems, really, 
the idea of operating systems as written by operating systems designers has retreated away from the machine into this kind of nice sort of closed sort of enclave, in this case, in the top left-hand corner of this diagram, where they can comfortably live in the fiction that they're on a nice sort of friendly CC NUMA machine uh, and not have to worry about all the rest of the stuff that's going on here, okay? Hardware designers have responded to limitations in the structure of an operating system by hiding more and more operating system functionality from the operating system itself because the operating system itself is incapable of dealing with it with the kind of hardware that is being necessitated by you know, the end of Moore's law and then art scaling and all the rest of that kind of thing. That's why this is a real problem. This why it's a problem now. So what about those very, very few people who are actually interested in writing new operating systems and manage to get them published in venues like OSDI. So what about those new operating systems papers, all three of them, uh, which have been published in the last two years in operating systems design and implementation? Okay, let's have a look at what they do. I, I think they're great, by the way. But one thing you notice about them is they all target exactly the same hardware assumptions as Linux. These are actually written for PCs because PCs are easy to get hold of and they're nice and simple and they're relatively well understood machines, okay? So they make the same assumptions that Linux does about the hardware. And unsurprisingly, they end up with actually fairly similar sort of structure, okay? They, they, they tend to have a kernel, they tend to have, you know, some replicated data structures for scalability. Um, this might be good enough, though, perhaps for server machines. Many of these, many of these operating systems actually target servers, and so perhaps you know we should just treat SOCs differently from mobile phones and things. Servers, this is kind of this is kind of good enough, and maybe this sort of Unix-like structure is actually still fine when you look at servers. So mm, hold that thought. Uh, spoiler alert: it's not going to end well. Uh, but anyway, for the moment, though, um, let's just see what they do, right? The clear message, though, right? The clear message that, that I think is being sent to people who like to come to these conferences, like me, is if you want to get published in operating systems design and implementation, you should work on machine learning, databases, distributed systems, and consensus graph processing, you know, security, privacy, indeed, almost anything but operating systems. Okay, I would observe that all of these subjects have their own multiple dedicated conferences, which are very high quality. They're really good conferences. The only one of these topics on this slide that does not have its own dedicated conference is in fact operating systems, okay? If you really, really insist on working on operating systems, make sure that the operating system you're working on is Linux, okay? And, you know, if you want to be awkward, <laughs> if you really want to be stubborn, and somehow you've got the luxury of being stubborn, or you just are stubborn, and you actually want to work on a non-Linux operating system, make sure that it looks like Linux. Make sure it makes the same assumptions as Linux about the hardware that it runs on. That's what your options are at a place like this, okay? I think it's a bit of a shame. But here is a recent anecdote, okay, that might be relevant to this discussion. Remember the, 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 the this problem here, okay? Now it turns out the assumption of a shared physical address space is kind of at the heart of what the, what this means, because the driver and the firmware on the modem have to do a whole load of pointer swizzling because there is no shared physical address space here. There are the shared memory, but it's different addresses, right? You have to actually do complicated remappings of, of addresses as, as you go between things, okay? So that's a fundamental assumption violated right there, okay? And so perhaps you might want to think about maybe fixing this problem, maybe coming up with a better model for this. In case you're wondering, by the way, uh, Barrelfish, for instance, doesn't actually solve this problem at all. It has exactly the same problem, which is that it assumes that there is a shared physical address space and has capabilities that refer to it. But we did produce a version of Barrelfish which fixed this problem. And it fixed this problem using a formally specified model of multiple different address spaces that captured the state of the machine, could be dynamically updated in the base. As mappings change, lookup tables get programmed, all kinds of things like that. And 
it carried the authorization model all the way through those complicated trans translations, and it would have solved this problem. Okay. Now, we have no trouble publishing this kind of work in formal methods conferences. They love this kind of stuff because it's actually applying formal methods to modeling the real world. And then they all, oh, hardware is interesting, isn't it? Yeah, we should look at that. You know, a great deal of enthusiasm. Right? We loved it. Very good conversations, really interesting stuff. Um, we weren't very successful in getting this work published, often because people didn't understand what we could do um, because it wasn't Linux. Okay. So, we had a brainwave. We thought, ah, let's remove the evaluation section. Let's remove the implementation section. Let's just not mention any operating system at all. But let's rename it to something that looks a bit like Linux. And let's just figure out how we can do a subset of this. Not all of this functionality and all the richness, but we can sort of special case this for a particular version that we could actually map into Linux. Let's just write up a quick proposal about this, send it into HotOS, and bingo, you get accepted. OK? There's a moral in there somewhere. OK. This is the slide that will probably get me kicked off the OSDI steering committee. So, um, you know, I um, I apologize for this if I cause offense. But there is a certain, you know, and I'm exaggerating for effect here. So please don't be offended by this if you think that I'm talking about you. But we do have a real problem here, which is that too many people don't actually know what modern hardware looks like and like to believe that basically it looks like a fancy Vax. If there's people in the audience who don't remember the VAX, and I suspect that's 95% of you, you can Google it. It was a nice computer in its day. Hank may be listening. Um, but this is basically ignorance about what hardware looks like. Hardware has changed. It is not the way it looks in textbooks. It is well documented, but it's, you know, people do not realize that this is what a computer is today. Okay. But I think there's another problem, which is that too many people find it much more comfortable to focus on what Linux does well. They don't want to go outside the nice comfort bubble of saying, oh yeah, Linux works fine on this kind of nice model of the hardware. The rest is just device drivers or something else. It's somebody else's problem. I don't need to worry about that, okay? Because I can work in operating systems just by looking at what Linux does in this little part of the machine and someone else will take care of the rest of it. And I'm afraid this is called denial. And I think that this is possibly a worse problem. And I think the trouble that we have in operating systems is a fair amount of operating systems denial and ignorance. Right? And I don't know how to fix this. Okay. But I would like to try. <laughs> I think fixing it is perhaps a cultural problem. But I would point out that this is a crazy situation to be in. We should be really excited about this situation. This is huge job security for people who like to work with operating systems. This is a great opportunity for people who want to get into what is, for me, I think one of the deepest, most interesting bits of computer science. Um, Chandu Tekath has a wonderful quote. He says, I wouldn't trust software written by anyone who hasn't written a first level interrupt handler, words to that effect. Um, there's a lot of interest in industry as well, in operating systems. And people are writing their own operating systems in industry. Companies are writing new operating systems which are not Linux and share no code with Linux. And they're writing it for a very variety of different reasons. Sometimes it's experimental. Sometimes it's because they want to get around licensing concerns. But often it's because they want functionality or security or assurance or simplicity or something else that Linux is not providing for them. This is an interesting time to be working in operating systems. And there is demand for it. This is a relevant problem. It is a timely problem. Okay, and This is the irony of all this, right? which is that operating systems are being abandoned by academia at a time when industry is beginning to sort of wake up to the idea that this is actually a really interesting and important problem. Okay, So I don't know what to do about the culture. I don't know what to do about getting people interested in operating systems. You know, we, what to do about getting people more open to the idea that there is really important, interesting work to be done here. But for people who do think there is, I have two modest suggestions for how to go ahead with this. First suggestion for how to deal, technically at least, with these issues, how to approach this, this, this situation, is to actually encourage people to actually have a go and program a system on a chip. Actually, think about what you might do to have an operating system that ran on the whole thing, rather than just a very small portion of the chip. 
Okay. Now these chips are not that expensive. Development boards are pretty cheap. Um, in the extreme case, I mean, you can do this on a Raspberry Pi if you want to. Um, it's not the most interesting SSC, but it's got plenty of stuff on there. It's kind of boots from the GPU, for goodness sake. But there's many, many other SSCs that you can pick right, um, and use, and they're interesting. They have complicated systems problems, right? and they are worth looking at. Okay, They can be a bit intimidating. All right. So here is the manual for the NXP processor that we use. It is 8,981 pages long. That's quite a lot. But we're computer scientists. We're systems people. We should be able to understand that manual. And, and frankly, you know, my, my students have no problem navigating that manual. Obviously, they you don't know the whole thing, but you can find your way through it to the kind of information that you need to know at any particular point, right? It, 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 sometimes this documentation isn't very good, but quite often this documentation is, is actually pretty good and it's pretty well structured. And we are computer scientists, for goodness sake. This is something that we should be able to do. Not only that, these things are enormously complex. It's true. And some people might be put off from engaging with the complexity of hardware just because it's complex. But hey, this is great. This is, this, is our, this is our world. We are computer scientists. Complexity is our business. Uh, we don't just create complexity. We build tools to tame complexity. Okay, This is a real-world complexity problem that we are uniquely positioned to be able to solve. And many people will thank us for it because there are many, many, many software engineers who have to negotiate documentation like this out in the real world. Okay, And if we can help that, that would be great. And we have lots of cool ways to do this now, right? We have lots of techniques that will help us. And we can build tools that will help us in various ways. This is a fundamental requirement for any kind of verified kernel to provide assurance to its users, for instance. And we've got verified kernels now. They're cool. People want them. They're excited. They're, they're, some of them even get accepted for publication at operating systems design and implementation. Okay, We can synthesize code from formal specifications of this kind of thing. That's a very interesting, cool idea. Margot Seltzer's group has been doing some really interesting work in that kind of area. Okay, You can do runtime verification of hardware and software if you can manage the complexity of hardware in a way that represents it in the machine. And that's what we're good at as computer scientists. Okay, We can just derive secure by construction interfaces, all kinds of cool things. There's a whole lot of cool stuff we could do here. Right? This is an amazingly cool research, research area. If you go down this route, we've tried this. It's fun. It's interesting. Lots of space to explore. We've explored a very tiny part of it. But what I would say is you might find something interesting as a result of that when you go into this kind of space. About 10 years ago, Jeff Mogul, Andrew Bauman, Livio Suarez, and myself wrote a paper called, called Mind the Gap that was about the gap between architecture and operating systems research. One of the points we're making in that paper was that it's hard for operating systems people and architecture people to communicate with each other. And architecture people don't necessarily understand a lot about operating systems concerns and so create problems for operating systems people. And likewise, operating systems people tend to be a bit passive aggressive about this stuff and not really complain about it or critique it. Um, and instead, you know, end up just griping about it privately in the bar at conferences or things like that. Okay. And so one of the consequences of this gap, and this gap remains to this day is that architecture people try to solve problems that they see as being problems without necessarily engaging operating systems people. Or if they do, they might engage operating systems people who no, don't necessarily want to solve that problem because it would be too disruptive to their own kind of models. Okay, And so one of the interesting things you, you discover about many of these SOCs is that for very good hardware design reasons, very good product development reasons, the hardware is almost designed to sandbox Linux in a corner where it can't cause too much trouble to the rest of the system. Okay, This is architecture people seeing that the operating system is not solving the problems for them, not being able to change the operating system or evolve it or replace it, and so design, deciding that they have no choice but to take matters into their own hands and design those problems into another part of the system. And you get an interesting understanding of that when you try and do right a fully heterogeneous operating system that programs all the cores and manages all the resources and tries to take everything into account, okay? which you can do based on the documentation. But then you begin to see, understand how these, this SOC design is now ossifying around this kind of 
this operating system that isn't really an operating system because it isn't really managing the machine. Okay. And that's an interesting thing. And I think that as researchers, our technical response to that has to be what my second suggestion here is, which is that we should be prepared to build our own computers. We should not be prepared necessarily to build products, but we should be, able to be prepared to build computers in order to help us do this research and explore alternative hardware designs that are not constrained by this need to support an operating system that isn't really performing the functions of an operating system anymore. Okay. So one thing has actually changed since 2011 when we wrote the Mind the Cap paper, and that is that it's much easier to get computers built. And if you think about what computer you might want to do research into the problem of how to write operating systems for heterogeneous SOCs with complicated interconnects, the kinds of hardware that is a reality today, then uh, you can come up with all kinds of interesting ideas. And there's lots of different ways to cut this. Uh, this is our idea. Uh, it's only one of many possible ones. It's called Enzian. You may have heard of it. Uh, what this is is basically it's an SOC on one side, and then it's got a big F FPGA on the other side, lots and lots of memory bandwidth, all kinds of other stuff like that. And the idea here is that this is a, a platform that is designed for us to do our own research on. Okay, And it turns out that you can actually today get something like this built. And, and, and we actually have. And, and here's a picture of it. And indeed, actually, <laughs> ooh, here is one. They're big and they're heavy, uh, but they're great. <laughs> they're so cool. Uh, we actually managed to get our own machine built. Okay, And it's a fascinating business. It's absolutely awesome experience. Uh, it's been stressful, um, but it's been hugely educational for us. We've learned so much from actually doing this, as well as now having a fantastic platform to actually do a lot of the research that, that we were doing in the group on, on uh, other bits of hardware and trying to work around some limitations of it. We can configure this to instrument things. We can configure this to actually emulate things. We can use it for all kinds of stuff. So, so you know, we're, we're, we're really glad that we went through the pain to do this. Okay, But one of the things that really came out of the experience for us of trying to build a machine uh, like Enzian is that we got to know what a computer really looks like. And we realized that we did not know. We did not know what a computer actually looked like inside, particularly a big computer like this. Okay, And we got to know that experience through having to write a lot of the sort of basic firmware that you normally don't see if you just buy a computer and then install Linux on it, or if you build a Linux kernel and then install that on it, for example. Okay. And so this was, this was an interesting experience. Let me show you another simplified diagram. This is a diagram uh, of Enzian. It's an early revision of the signal flow diagram for Enzian. Okay. But the interesting thing about this diagram is not the Enzian specific stuff, right? The, the fact that there's, you know, there are two main sort of NUMA nodes here, right? There's some sort of CPU over here, Thunder X, and then there's an FPJ here. That doesn't really affect this argument at all. It's actually the less interesting bit from this perspective. Think of this as a two-node NUMA server machine. The interesting thing here is actually this thing in the middle here. This thing in the circle, this chip is the board management controller. Okay, And almost any server looks like this. In this respect, Enzian is not that unusual. It's fairly conventional for a design for a server machine. Okay. Uh, what is unusual about Enzian is that uh, this board management controller is um, very open. <laughs> it's very clear. We had to write all the software for it. And so on Enzian, you get to see this uh, in a way that you wouldn't necessarily see this if you're operating on regular Linux on a regular server. But it's still there. That's the point, is it's still there. And this thing is in charge of sequencing power and clock, thermal monitoring, uh, throttling, all kinds of things for the whole system. And it runs a lot of code. Actually, it's a small, um, it's a zinc processor. It actually runs Linux currently. We're looking to replace that with something like SEL4. It runs Linux. It runs a system called OpenBMC. It controls everything about the machine. It has a huge amount of privilege in the machine. It can see memory. It can read write memory. It can configure memory controllers. And it runs several hundred thousand lines of code before the main CPU here comes out of reset. Okay, so this is a hugely important thing. Okay, but what's also interesting about this is that you begin to realize when you start writing the software for this that actually this as a server machine. Remember, I talked about new operating systems being written to this nice, cozy server model. This is the reality 
of modern servers. They are not nice and cozy at all. They are just as complex, just as heterogeneous, just as weirdly configurable as SOCs are. It's just that, again, that's kind of hidden from you. And this, in a sense, I, I think that the experience of trying to write the firmware that controls all the other processes on this that are embedded in all these different sort of peripheral chips here, all the voltage regulators, clock regulators have their own processes and everything. The process of doing that for us was the final nail in the coffin of this cozy kind of model of hardware, which I've tried to persuade you is a complete fantasy, right? It's a fantasy, it doesn't exist. It's not merely fictitious, it is a dangerous fiction because it makes us forget and ignore issues that are really important. And these are operating systems issues. And the security people are worrying about this, the architecture people are worrying about this, but we should be worrying about this. Not only should we be worrying about this, we should be excited about the fact that this is a cool thing to work on. So to summarize, okay, operating systems research is really needed right now, right? Hardware is different in interesting and scary ways, right? And there's a lot of interest in what this means for operating systems. Companies are prepared to write new operating systems, right? They are writing new operating systems. There's a lot of research in this area, also in academia, in security, in architecture. This community doesn't actually seem to be very interested in this, which is odd, given that it's an operating system problem. The way, something about the way that we deal with academic research at the moment is actually discouraging this work. And I think this is bad. And I think that we need to do something about this. And I think that the heart of this problem is that there is, in operating systems, denial about the fact that what we think of as conventional operating systems might solve these problems, they don't. And there is also ignorance about what is actually happening inside real hardware. A lot of this stuff, as I said, all these models of hardware are fantasies. Reality is very different. It's interesting, it's documented, it's challenging to engage with, but that's kind of the point. And so in a sense, this is an amazing opportunity. This is exciting. I'm excited about this kind of thing. There is so much cool, interesting, fun, creative work to be done in trying to address the operating systems problems, challenges that are raised by this kind of hardware and to really rethink how you manage a hardware platform. And we've got great tools to do this, right? Which weren't around 50 years ago when Unix was done and weren't around, you know, 20 years ago. We've got really good formal methods tools, thanks to people like you know, the SEL4 team and other kind of folks. We've got really interesting languages. You know, you can look at stuff in Rust. You know, we've seen some examples in this conference of Rust operating systems. Um, we've got other kinds of tooling. And we've got also amazing new hardware that can help us build this stuff. FPGAs really do change the game when you're trying to write an operating system. They, they're both in terms of what you want to target, but also what you can use to help debug it profile it, monitor it, help design it. Okay, why are we wasting all of this opportunity and all this talent and this, this, this time on basically a 50-year-old view of hardware that really doesn't apply anymore? I think we could do so much better, right? There is a great opportunity here to do that. And, and that's why I'm excited about it. But at the same time, I wish there was more attention being paid to this problem in conferences like this. Thank you very much. That's all I have to say. I would like to acknowledge a load of people in the Enzian team um, at ETH and elsewhere who felt a lot. Um, we're very, very grateful to all that kind of stuff. It's been a wild ride. It's still a wild ride, but it's been a tremendous experience. Um, so thanks for that. You know, operating systems are really collaborative work, and we've had a lot of great collaborations on this. So um, that's it. And with that, uh, I'm done. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Thanks, Mothy, for that very provocative talk. Um, it was really interesting and um, I guess a little humbling uh, speaking as you know, one of the people involved in putting together the, the operating systems program that, uh, that didn't have a high percentage of core operating system papers. Um, and we do have uh, we do have a few questions that have been coming in on the Slack channel, and I hope we'll see more as we as we get into the Q and A here. Um, one of the first ones, I think, um, it's not so much a question, but a comment on I guess the the difficulty or you know the barriers to entry and getting started in something like this, given the complexity of operating system code and the extreme complexity of the hardware now with the systems on the chip and and the fact that you know really we're 
we all have this fantasy of what the hardware looks like that we perpetuate by teaching that fantasy to our undergraduate students and bringing them into grad school with uh, with the same um, the same view. So, you know, you 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 put up a very large list of collaborators there. And it's obviously a lot of people involved in in something like this. Do you have any um, suggestions or advice on how to overcome that? Um, I guess that initial entry barrier. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Um, is the audio working? I can hear you. Good. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, I, I, I wasn't, wasn't intending to criticize um, OSDI, and I certainly wasn't intending to criticize um, the chairs of this conference, including yourself. Uh, I think it's a great program. That, don't get me wrong. Um, and, and I think that I, I'm really not interested in, in, in blaming anybody here or anything. I'm just sort of pointing out that this is the, sort of the reality of this stuff. And you know, most other conferences look pretty much the same. Um, I don't buy this argument that operating systems are hard. Systems is hard. We should be working on hard problems. I, I, I think it's um, the idea that we should be working only on stuff that's easy has a very interesting implication, which I suspect the question I didn't intend to imply, which is that if they're working on something that isn't operating systems, they're doing it because it's just much, much easier and it's less deep intellectually and it's kind of, you know, uh, less of a sort of, you know, um, hard and challenging problem than, than real operating systems. I, I, that's not an argument I want to get into. I, I, think that's, um, I think that's a very dangerous kind of road to go down. I think it's, it's, it is intellectually deep, but many other fields are intellectually deep. I also think that the engineering argument, the, the idea is that there's a lot of effort that you need to go into to write a lot of code, is also wrong. Um, I, I think most systems actually require an awful lot of code. Uh, Linux requires a vast amount of code, but that's kind of part of the point. I mean, if you, if you know, I, I think the the, um, the comment was, um, there's so much code you have to understand. You have to, you know, find your way through all these millions of lines of code. No, you don't, because you shouldn't be looking at Linux in the first place, right? You should be figuring out what we understand about operating systems. You can look at much simpler systems, right, that are much easier to understand. FreeBSD, for example, is much easier to understand than Linux, even though it has most of the same functionality. But you can also, you know, argue that actually the amount of functionality that's really interesting from an operating systems perspective for research is much less. Um, look at SEL4, right? That's a much, much easier piece of code to understand. It's much smaller, it's much easier to do. So there's, I don't buy this argument that it's hard, or if it is hard, it should be hard. It's not necessarily harder than other fields. Um, we should be putting the work in. I, uh, Jeff Chase used to quote um, H.T. Kung, this is a wonderful quote, systems hard, must work harder. You know, uh, That's just the kind of the reality, but it's not that difficult to do the engineering. Um, and, you know, this community has built some huge artifacts in the past, very, very complicated pieces of engineering. And the, re the way you do it is you do it collaboratively, right? You share code, right? Uh, we're lucky enough to have had quite a lot of people coming through the group here and working on Enzian. But I mean, Enzian is a, I mean, it's a huge hardware, hardware project. But for writing an operating system, sure, you know, we could just, you know, we don't, it doesn't need to be one university, you know, we could work together. So I, I, I don't buy the argument that it's hard, um, I'm afraid. <laughs> but there we go. All right. Well, thanks for that uh, encouragement for people to work more collaboratively. Because you know, I I agree we should uh, shy away from things because they're hard. But there are a lot of moving parts, and certainly uh, from the formal methods side of things hmm. and the you know programming languages, the hardware, the systems, it's all gotten a lot more complicated uh, certainly than when I started in this field. Um, so moving on to the, the next question, uh, this is from uh, Mickey Gable at the University of Toronto. He says, you know, are you making an argument um, that you should be treating a single computer as a distributed system of multiple workers, each with its own operating system? Or uh, phrased differently, why should there be one operating system controlling the whole distributed system that we call a, an SOC? Uh, no, I'm not making that argument. Um, uh, myself and a bunch of other people made that argument um, about 12 years ago, and uh, uh, we got a test of time award for it recently, um, but I'm not making that argument here at all. Um, I think that's one option for how to manage a heterogeneous machine. But ultimately, you know, th th again, the definition of an operating system 
again, I, I think what, 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 what Mickey's doing is he's falling into this ontological trap of saying, what is an operating system? And I'm more interested in what, what is it that the operating system does? And what is it that is doing what the operating system should do? So we've got an SOC, it's a single unit, it's a single administrative domain, or it may well be, you know, modular enclaves and things. Um, what is the operating system for that? What is it that does that, right? Now, it might be a collection of different kernels, one of which might be Linux or several of which might be Linux. Fine, I, I, that's a, an interesting open question. What I'm saying is we should think about that as a problem. And to simply say, oh, it's a distributed system, doesn't actually solve any problems at all. Again, it's an ontological argument. It doesn't actually tell you how to make anything work. And so, sure, you can structure what it, we end up calling the operating system for one of these machines in a variety of different ways. Uh, go ahead, knock yourself out. Um, but think about it as a complete problem, right? And you may end up borrowing ideas from distributed systems. What we found in Barrelfish was that it is a distributed system, but it's not a classical distributed system. There's a whole lot of stuff that makes things complex, like shared memory, for instance, and different kinds of cache coherence. Fine. But think about writing an operating system that actually manages the whole machine and what the problems are in doing that, rather than saying, I'm just going to focus on this tiny little core in the corner. All right, thank you. We have another question from Abby Das, who asks if the OEMs actually allow the programmer to access those secret hidden computers in the SOSC. Are there specific instructions for that in the ISA? You know, can the programmer actually get at them? Um, the answer is that it depends to some extent on, on the, um, I guess, on the SOSC. So, um, you know, on, on, on the, the NXP, for instance, uh, it turns out you can. I mean, this is all pretty well documented. In fact, this thing is a system control processor here. That stuff, I believe, uh, I may have a student run into the room very shortly and tell me, no, it doesn't work. But uh, there's a lot of documentation on how this kind of stuff works in, in, in the manual. Um, it's running a very different sort of software, but it is possible to sort of, um, you know, reflash this. It, there's some complicated code here because it is doing power sequencing for the rest of the SSC, but it's not too bad. Um, so, no, the, um, there are some processes that are much harder to get documentation for. But on the other hand, Try, you right? The more of us who try, the more of us who ask people about this, the more of us who demonstrate that we could actually help if we knew about some of these things, um, the better. Uh, we picked, for Enzian, we picked uh, Cavium Thunder X1. That doesn't have public documentation. But as soon as we started talking to Cavium, now Marvell, they were super helpful. They were very, very nice to us about it. And they, 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 they uh, gave us a lot of very, very useful documentation, a lot of consultation, um, and allowed us to sort of um, uh, that, that was enough for us to, to do a lot of work, um, and it didn't really impede what we could publish about the system or what we could what's, what code we could release open source about the system. So th this stuff is not too difficult to get hold of. Some companies are notoriously bad, but just avoid those companies. Cool. Um, I was working my way down the list here. So Jeff Mogul asks, uh, could we make the argument that only hot OS actually accepts interesting papers about OS research because the workshop's tolerance for half-baked ideas allows for a less ossified view of OS research? Or perhaps the need for OSDI's PC to review lots of ML and graph processing papers has caused the PC to be populated by people who only have limited expertise in what OS research really is. <laughs> Hashtag asking for a friend. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I think that I think the diagnosis of what might be wrong with many PCs is probably right you know, on the mark. I don't think it's a complete picture, but I think it's on the mark. It's not clear to me that hot OS avoids that problem. There was, you know, I, I, I had I actually haven't gone back and done the analysis of how many operating systems papers there were at hot OS but I would wager it's less than a quarter of the program this year. Uh, I'm trying to remember now, it seems such a long time ago. Uh, but uh, I, I do like hot OS as a venue because I do like the half-baked ideas thing. Uh, we managed to submit a fully baked, fully implemented, fully evaluated idea by disguising it as a half-baked idea. I think that's an interesting, <laughs> interesting situation. Um, but it's, it's a great workshop, it's a fantastic workshop, but I'm not sure it really, you know, has an operating systems focus. I would love an opera, I would love a workshop that was basically entirely devoted to operating systems. Um, maybe we should start one. 
So we're technically running into the break time here, but there's uh, there's still more comments and questions in the Slack, and we it is a relatively lengthy break. So if you have time to stay with us for a bit, Mothi, it would be great to keep this going. I'm I'm happy to stay here, or um, yeah, I'm happy to stay on Zoom, or I'm happy to to do on Slack. Yeah, if you like, that's fine. Maybe we'll take a few more on Slack. Back and then um, if you if you want to join the OEA and uh, maybe we can continue a conversation there and let people ask their questions directly instead of having them mediated through me. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah. We have a we have a question from Scott Guthridge who asks, is the push to move everything to user space and bypass the kernel part of the same problem that the operating system isn't solving the problems we need it to? Um, I'm not sure. I, I um, that may be the case. Actually, um, there's always been a push to move stuff into user space, and get, because simply you know, kernel transitions cost. You know, this is a very old idea. It's it's uh, um, it does to some extent slightly change the structure of the operating system, but I think it's slightly orthogonal to the argument I'm kind of trying to make here. Is that most of those efforts right now in Linux, you know, really are still predicated on the same model of the hardware, the same view of the hardware, right? You push stuff in from the kernel up into user space, it's still running on the same processes, it's still assuming a uniform address space, it's still assuming a uniform architecture in the machine. Um, you know, and so I, I, I would put, you know, uh, um, microkernels, you know, or a microkernel by itself, um, in a similar kind of category to Linux. What's different is that microkernels do give you a little bit more flexibility as to how you implement stuff inside the kernel. So for example, things like, you know, um, some of the, uh, the few papers that do get published on, operate, on new operating systems, again, they're not really engaging with the hardware. They're still in this kind of nice cozy CC NUMA model. And moving stuff in user space is, is a perfectly good thing to do at that point, but it's not engaging with the fact the hardware is fundamentally changing underneath. But typically, the thing that you're talking to from user space is actually a whole set of other processes running its own kernel and other kinds of stuff. So I've no objection to that. Uh, I think it's a, in many ways, it's a fine architectural thing to do, but it's not really what I was arguing. I think some of this has been touched on, but there's, a, there's another question from Vastav Anand. He says, you know, you mentioned that getting OS papers published is hard and doing the OS research is hard, but what do you think is the right solution for the problem of not getting, um, of the OS research not happening or getting expect, accepted, despite there being a very rich problem space here? Mm -hmm. I think it's a very hard problem. I, I, I think, and as I said, I, I didn't really want to go there in this talk to some extent. I think there's a number of factors that, you know, all interlock, which makes it that this is a hard problem and it's not going to be solved quickly. Um, I think it would be good to have a venue that was in basically dedicated to operating systems in the way that there's venues that are dedicated to databases, for instance, or venues that are dedicated to, to programming languages, venues that are dedicated to security. It'd be nice to have a venue that was dedicated to operating systems. Um, but that's not going to actually solve the problem by itself um, because there may not be enough people working on this, or if there are, you know, they may be discouraged from submitting to a brand new conference and stuff. And so getting the quality might be difficult. You know, there's uh, many, many really, really good groups who only ever submit to the top conferences. Um, so I'm not sure that's gonna solve it entirely. I, I, I do think it's a, it's a cultural change um, among a number of people. There, there, there's uh, submitting operating system papers, many, many people who do stubbornly persist in submitting operating systems papers I've talked to have very similar experiences. They submit a paper to a conference that purports to be about operating systems and they get three reviews back, which are weak rejects. And in the days when confidence levels were being specified, low confidence on all three, or you know, generally the reviewers express very low confidence about operating systems papers. And that says something about the program committee, which is, I guess, is the point that Jeff was making sort of earlier. Um, and, and, and I, you know, I've chaired this conference, uh, both, I chaired both these conferences actually. Um, and it's a challenge putting a PC together. It's much harder than it was, you know, when I was doing it, PCs are much, much larger. You're trying to cover this huge range of space. And so finding people who, you know, understand enough about this kind of thing, you know, in a, a conference that is this broad, who can actually critically review those things is hard. So I think that's another problem. 
And as I said, I, I, I think one of the things I probably was addressing, trying to address in this talk, is I don't think people really understand what the hard problems are in operating systems these days. Um, and I tried to sort of give an example of some of those hard problems. And that's partly because of this, you know, this lack of understanding of the machines that we work with. All right. Well, thanks again, Mathi. Um, I think, you know, we, we do have these conversations ongoing about, you know, research. And mm -hmm. one of the things that comes up often is the question of, you know, are we obsessed with evaluation in this field, which makes it mm -hmm. difficult to, you know, start a you know, very new project off the ground. Um, I think it's it's healthy for us to keep having these reflective conversations and asking about you know how we how we do better. Uh, so thank you again for for a very provocative uh, take on where operating systems research is going. Hopefully, um, people are again, still talking to me. <laughs> there there are a lot more. Uh, there are still a lot of comments going on in the Slack, and I think it's great that people are are continuing with that. Um, I don't have the, the link at my fingertips now, but maybe somebody else can post it in. Um, we do have the, the OEA platform um, if folks want to head over there during the break and uh, continue this conversation. I think that would be wonderful. And um, everyone, please, uh, I know you can't see the applause of the audience, unfortunately, but uh, I think everyone enjoyed this very much. So thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thanks very much.